awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks, you all, for, for coming to my talk. I uh, hope you're having a great, uh, great DEF CONF. Um, it, it's really nice that there is a real open source conference in Boston. Um, and I'm, I'm really thankful for the organizers uh, that, that they're restarting it, rebooting it after, after the break. Um, I gave the same speech at DEF CONF in Brno earlier this year. Um, so if you were there, I apologize that this is repetitive, but I don't think I, well, I, I, I know one person in the room that has seen it. Um, so I want to talk about decentralization, open source, and Web3. And um, I decided to give this talk because I, I, I gave a talk uh, two years ago or so at FOSDEM um, where I mentioned Web3 and a big groan went through the room. And people are like, oh, he mentioned Web3, it's all scam. So I want to change some perceptions around that. Um, quick background, I'm not going to bore you with that. So I used to work at Red Hat. I was heavily involved in, uh, in DEF CONF even. Uh, I'm not at Red Hat anymore. And um, nothing I say or do represents the opinion of my current, former, or future employers. Um, so why do we do free software? Right? Um, many people kind of see it more as kind of a supply chain thing for uh, the finance industry nowadays. Um, and it lives in the cloud, and the cloud runs on open source, and we are very proud of our success that um, even Microsoft, who probably still thinks that open source is a cancer, and that was a quote, um, it runs everything in the cloud on top of open source. Um, that's not where open source, where free software comes from, right? I'm going to use open source and free software synonymously, or sometimes say FOSS, because like, I, I think the debate, like what is what, is kind of uh, a bit too much in the weeds. Um, so you know, the, the, the definition right, is software where the users have the freedom to run, copy, distribute, study, change, and improve the software. Right? The point is that the users, the downstream receiver, get certain rights. It is not a concept that is meant to empower necessarily the author of the software. Of course, it doesn't exist without the authors, so that's kind of essential to have them. And of course, it enables them to collaborate better. But um, the point is that it enables the downstream receiver to do more things with the software. Proprietary software, and proprietary used to be the biggest, propri the biggest differentiator in our industry, right? Um, proprietary software also have, has authors, right? The difference is not that people write code, the difference is what you can do with the code once you receive it, and the collaboration model and the empowerment that gives you. And the, the point is here that it gives you access to technology. It completely democratizes access to technology. It takes away any control um, people have. And it removes the biggest inhibitor to innovation, which is keeping things secret. In a way, you can look at it as the um, making true what the promise of the scientific method is, and what even the promise of something I really despise, the patent system, was, right? The original justification for the patent system, which gives a government guaranteed monopoly to someone who had an idea on this idea for a certain amount of time, and then many tricks to extend that. Um, the idea there was that in exchange for get, getting that monopoly, you publish the state of the art, enabling others to build on top of the state of the art. That's been largely perverted, and it's completely abused and useless at this point, and just inhibits innovation. Open source is the right way of doing it, where your reward for publishing your, the state of the art, for publishing your work and granting the rights, is that you build, you stand on the shoulders of, of giants, right? You stand on 
99% of the code you're going to use that already exists and you improve the one and in extreme cases 5% that are different that your contribution is and you grant the same rights to everyone else to move the state of the art ahead. That's the most successful innovation model we know right now. Um, especially because it, it still has the room for individual initiative and innovation. Right? At the same time, it also is the greatest equalizer of access to technology, removing uh, barriers. I, I often have an anecdote I, I tell here how I got to open source, actually, which is kind of funny in the context of IBM, because um, I, as a teenager, I tried to learn programming. I learned programming with Turbo C on DOS and wanted to use something better than DOS. You know, multitasking was really appealing. So I, I tried out OS2. But Turbo C didn't work on OS2, even in the Windows compatibility mode. But my father at the time was riding the train every morning to work um, with someone from IBM. And they talked every day on the way to work. Right? They had this group of people who always sat together and talked. And so the guy offered, well, if your son is interested, maybe we can give you some, some access to technology. So I gave them a list. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's $30,000 worth of software licenses. So uh, sorry, can't do that. So I used um, GC, uh, uh, the, the GCC port instead which uh, was done by DJ Delory, who works for Red Hat. Right? So um, that's how I got into open source software. Right? Um, point is, I had no chance of getting uh, you know, the IBM compiler suite on OS2. It just wasn't possible. I could go back to DOS. Right? Um, that was the only option at the time in you know, my scope. This was before Linux. Uh, I, I'm, as you can see, I'm a bit older. Um, this was before Linux uh, existed, right? So um, that wasn't an option yet. And like, I mean, I guess Minix would have been an option, but like that wasn't like in my scope as, as a young teenager. Um, I did switch from OS2 to Linux in, I think, uh, 94. So uh, yeah, I got saved. But it started with DJ Delory and his GCC port. Um, the point is the empowerment it gives you, right? It took away. Uh, hurdle for me to get into this. So open source really matters, right? It levels the, the playing field. It gives you access to technology. It has a, um, the uh, collaboration model. And it is a foundation for sovereignty, right? And when I say sovereignty, I mean individual sovereignty. I mean organizational sovereignty. And at the end, even national sovereignty. Um, I recommend like a book. It's a bit old now. It's called Code by um, Larry Lessig. Um, this was like in the early 90s. He made the point that in the digital world, code becomes law. And more than traditional law, right? In the physical world, if there's a law, whether it's a good one or a bad one, you have the option to violate it, and then there are consequences. The difference in the digital world is that the, techno the code limits your ability. And if you can't access the code, you don't even have the option to violate the law, right? I mean, you can find ways to hack into it, right? But that's a whole different level of barrier. And with the growing complexity, it becomes a hard boundary, right? If the code prevents you from doing something, you don't have an option to go out of it. You have no sovereignty. And that applies to every level of you know, individual humans to the aggregation into nations or groups of nations that are limited by, the, uh, by code and the power structures behind that. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, now, why am I talking about that? Now, like, there are some threats to free software. And um, they, the, the, one of the biggest threats, and that was my original talk at Foster, was is cloud. Cloud is a threat to free software because it leads, it moves the proprietary differentiator from code to operating the code, right? Um, I don't know, anyone here still runs their own mail server? Mail, mail, email server, no, because it's just like, I mean, I used to do that, I gave up because it just the amount of work you have to put into it to keep that safe, right? For, and I, actually, I don't even use email much anymore, right? So it's, an, it's a trade-off. But it used to be a really important thing, right? That was your individual sovereignty to run your own mail server. We all, if you're old enough, we all cared about that at a point. Um, and 
you know, and that like that progress, that progress, that progress. And right now, I mean, we don't run much ourselves anymore. We're totally dependent on um, other services, right? Centralization always extended. It's super convenient. There's a network effect. It's the same thing that happened with proprietary software. And it's not necessarily bad, right? It helped. I mean, GitHub is great. It boosted collaboration much more than anything before. But it also shows the absurdity. Because Git was created as a decentralized alternative to a centralized system to break out of the limitation and value extraction of that centralized system that became an inhibitor to the kernel development. That Linus Torvalds created this new thing that's totally decentralized. And now we're using it in the most centralized version ever. And you know, Microsoft controls what is 90% of all open source collaboration and has it found a way to monetize it? I mean, that's absurd. It's, it's uh, yeah, it, it's crazy, right? And the problem, I mean, that in itself, as long as they're playing well, okay. Um, you always, in, in fundamentally, the fundamental right in, in free software is your right to fork, right? Because you get the downstream right, and if you're not happy, you have no right to someone else's labor, right? You know, if you pay them, you have a contract on that. If you buy a subscription from Red Hat, you have some right for, you have an agreement with Red Hat and some duties, and then um, you get something from them. But at the end, no kernel developer owes you anything. You, you owe them for creating uh, Linux. On the other hand, if you don't like what they're doing, you can always fork, and then it comes down to critical mass. Do enough people care about what you do, right? Vote with your feet. Um, is the only thing you can do there. But of course, that becomes more problematic. And that applies even to proprietary services you use in this context, and that's fine. The problem uh, is when you have uh, uh, too much critical mass. And I'm not, like I just said up front, I'm not calling for any regulation or anything against GitHub, no trust cases, whatever. Because I think that is something that we as an open source community have to deal with if we care enough. Right? My point is we should care because the centralization creates central choke points and eventually will lead, or already has led, to interventions that undermine the ability to collaborate around open source. GitHub, I'm not aware of like big problems there, but there are small problems, like here and there people getting locked out of accounts and something, and that gets problematic. Um, some cases may be justified, but still questionable, right? I mean, there was this guy who, I think, tried to blow up someone. Um, there's another guy where someone murdered uh, their wife, uh, let, no, got convicted, right? Uh, file system, famous file system. Uh, right, so these things happen, right? Um, some of them are justified, some are problematic. If you look at it from a from a open source point of view, why uh, do people that do something bad on one end lose access um, to a centralized system? Um, the the biggest problem, though, I think, is regulatory intervention. And right now, I see the EU as kind of the worst player there. But this is always um, always a, a game that builds on each other. Um, the you know, and the big things are, are right now, it, it, you know, it's it's um, speech rules, right? Uh, that become a problem. You can stand here, there, where the where the uh, boundary is. But I assure you, like, if the worst get through, I mean, if China, the Chinese government defines your speech rules, then you have a problem, right? That's probably not going to happen in the near term because it's a market structure. However, we have already seen with GDPR, which is a, a well-intended but misguided privacy protection law from Europe that really inhibits AI uh, development. And now the AI rules in Europe, that they have a tendency to infect others because if, you want, if your company wants to have business in Europe, they have to comply. They're going to comply globally, and that starts limiting your ability. Right? Um, I'm not a big fan of Donald Trump, but the fact that the EU tried, an unelected bureaucrat in the EU tried to prevent um, Elon Musk from interviewing uh, Donald Trump, if the Russians do that, we call it meddling in the election, right? The EU tried that. They wrote a letter. So you see that there's interest um, to expand regulatory 
intervention beyond a country, right? And we can go back to um, the crypto wars, which I, I recommend, uh, 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 the slides will be published, you can go to it. There's a, a, a video called Cypherpunks Cy Write Code. It's kind of, it's a bit funny because it's done by non-technical people and half of it is kind of, you're like, what? But um, it's really an interesting summary of like how cryptography got liberated from the control of US export control, right? It's something people don't um, recognize anymore because it's you know, a long time ago. Um, but you know, when, when I started using even web browsers, right, if you were not in the US, you could not have secure, like, like anything near to secure encryption. You had um, kind of a neutered um, uh, uh, TLS, or uh, I guess SSL, uh, so neutered RSA with limited key strength and limited implementation, and exporting it was like a nightmare. I had actually, that was part of my job at Red Hat at the time when, when I moved to the US. Um, the, the export compliance, um, a lot like of the rules around how things are published and stuff actually came from that, not from GPL compliance. It's really mind-boggling if you go into that. Uh, because um, the US said, well, this is basically weapons technology, so we want to control who gets uh, cryptography, right? And that was, like, that was like a big move to prevent technology in a centralized platform that would have been impossible to work around. They worked around, interestingly, by printing the code of G for, for GNU PG. They printed the code because that was undisputed First Amendment. If you print something and send a book, they exported the book, scanned it, and that's how we got GNU PG. Or now back in the way, no, PGP. It was before GNU PG. PGP in Europe. I mean, this is crazy. And like people are like, oh, what you're talking about with regulatory intervention and uh, limiting the, your freedom in free software. We've been there. Right? We, ha we fought our way through that, and then actually, uh, uh, because, uh, you know, I, and I, I think that's very sensible of the U.S. regulatory apparatus, they exempt open source largely from this, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that's going to stay that way, and right now the EU, if you look at the recent both, um, you know, so they're trying to introduce web, con web chat scanning, they, introduce crypt they want to introduce cryptographic limitations, um, they're limiting AI in ways that are the same kind of thinking, and they're going to they're gonna affect anyone in Europe. They're going to infect us through centralized platform, for example. Right? Um, so this is why this is relevant. Um, the, you know, centralization, I mean, I, I kind of talked about that already. Um, it's the gravitational pull that's a problem, right, in centralization. It's really convenient. It's really good to have a lot of stuff in the same place where a lot of people can collaborate if the platform does it. I mean, I, I still do Facebook and Twitter, even though I'm on Mastodon and on, on, on um, Noster. But, you know, everyone else is on these two, so I get my content from these two. You know? Now there are some bridges. So I'm, exp you know, I'm, I'm, I'm now trying to read all the Twitter updates in Mastodon, which is a bit, eventually maybe it's going to go there. But you know, the point is, as long as everyone is on the centralized platform, the centralized platform has, an, uh, has a lot of, of influence, right? And if you see everything that's happening in these platforms will eventually happen with code, right? Like the same kind of interventions and fighting and try attempts to control um, what can be done, which I think is better done downstream, right, where you decide what you want to see and not someone else decides for you what you're allowed to see, right? Um, so decentralization, right? Um, only decentralization, only if, you, if, you, if not everything is controlled by a small number of platforms in one place, can we maintain the, the model, in my view, because um, you, you know, and, uh, like, I, even, we can even go into things like, like the CNCF, right? Great foundation. The CNCF has been better than OpenStack on this, but there's always like, something that's so centralized where like, in one place decisions are taken, stacks are defined. Eventually, there's so much pressure to pick winners, for example. 
and like kind of do an upstream distribution. It becomes a goal for marketing. It becomes a, like you're as a VC funded um, startup, you know, if your VC money depends on being an incubation project and stuff like that. The, the incentives just work against picking the best, um, the best model and it becomes kind of a game who is the most popular in a, a specific environment, who knows the right people, right? That's always a problem. And that's, you know, I, I mean, it's a bit controversial. That's my view why OpenStack failed. Right? It's not a technical problem. OpenStack failed because they became uh, this organization that tried to pick winners and do upstream distribution. Decide, like in, in the Linux kernel is a kernel, right? It doesn't pick your packaging model. It doesn't pick anything else in your stack. Um, it never tries to control the distribution. Like I, I call it the distribution because it's my Linux RHEL background, right? But but like the the, op, the the aggregate product that makes this useful that that aggregates the components into something you can actually use, right? Which you can build up like anything, any service, any product is an aggregation of other products nowadays. Any service is an aggregation of other services. The moment where the community project tries to pick the winners and define the whole stack, you get into trouble because it becomes too much of a, of a, a too valuable to control it and it will fail. And that's what happened to OpenStack in my view. I mean, um, it's been, been some time. And that, again, is, that's a problem of centralization. Decentralization protects from that because you have competing models, you have other people uh, trying things. We have, you know, at least, right now, I think at least six healthy Linux distribution universes that do their own way of compiling, uh, com combining things, own package uh, selections. Good ideas prevail through them, but you always have the ability to try out something else. I think that's very healthy. Right? Even if the commercial market is very much dominated by Red Hat, at least in the um, English-speaking world, I'd say, um, but probably beyond that, uh, it's still a healthy competition. Right? Um, and if you go into the kind of non-standard product world, it's much broader. Right? And it's pretty healthy. And that's how, how everything should be. The, I'm not saying that, that uh, CNCF has that problem right now. I don't pay enough attention to say that. I just say it's a huge risk because we have seen this happen before. Um, so only decentralization can, you protect, can protect you from that. Um, and uh, the problem with that, though, it's really inconvenient. <laughs> like decentralization, it's more work. Right? Sometimes it's actively dangerous. That's why do we don't run our own mail, uh, email service anymore because you, know, you would get hacked. Just what it is. Um, I mean, I, I don't run any public-facing service, right, other than a VPN endpoint, right, and that very carefully, um, because it's just risky, right. And um, so the the question is, what can you do um, to still create? a decentralized open source model where people can have this effect of sovereignty and control and alternatives and innovation. And um, I think, uh, you know, largely there are, there are three, um, there are three approaches right now that I think can be combined. I mean, underlying open source code is great, right? Um, it's not as useful as you can't run it. Right? So we want to be able to run it. Um, the Fediverse is one way you run it. So Fediverse is largely in social media. And some of the examples here are in social media and collaboration, because that's where a lot of this is battled out. Right? Um, so uh, the Fediverse is, um, is interesting, because it's basically a traditional open source model of kind of, um, and I think I have a slide on that. So I'll go deeper into that. So Vediverse, cryptocurrencies are decentralized, and it, it's it, kind of its own debate, but it's important in this context. And then Web3, right, which um, is different from the Fediverse and different from cryptocurrencies. Uh, so it's, let's start with cryptocurrencies. Uh, who thinks that cryptocurrencies are a scam? It's less than in Renault, I'm surprised. But, um, so I mean, I, of course, they're scamming. Right, but um, I mean, they're scamming everywhere. Where's finance? Right, they're scamming in cash. They're scamming in uh, stocks. I mean, I lost I lost more money with traditional stocks and very well vetted VC um, funded alternative finance companies than ever with crypto. I mean, but of course they're scamming, um, and it's a tool that people use 
to transfer money from scams, right? That's true. Um, but at the same time, it also has already changed the world for a lot of people. I, a great example is if you look at um, immigrant communities that send money home, right? A lot from places where you don't have, I mean, if you're in the US and you have a bank account, it can be annoying, but it's not like impossible to send money. In Europe, it's much easier for now. Um, but if you're like in, a, in certain uh, uh, countries, right, where people tend to come to the US to work um, and make a better life, but still send money back to their families, that can be really hard, right? And often that is either, either like, money orders who are, have more scams than crypto, I'd say, and it was the original way of pe how people do, did the scamming. The second one is uh, you go to some internet cafe or something, give someone money, and then some part of that money eventually shows up at the other end, right? That's how this works. With crypto, there's suddenly a transparent way to do that with minimal fees that works globally, right? That's why in a lot of, like, tech-savvy people in emerging Countries use this a lot to get around corrupt and defunct banking systems and corrupt and uh, abusive other finance transaction models. And I can tell you, as someone, I work in a, in a startup. Uh, I, I write invoices to a startup in Europe. Um, this is much easier to get my money, right? It's just lower fees. It's immediately there. I don't have to wait a week. Uh, it gets reported, like I use a, a reputable platform, so it gets reported to the IRS the same way, right? There's no difference. Um, and, you know, it's like the, scare, or the, the, the danger of things being stolen is not worse than with credit cards. The liability for me is probably a bit worse because in the US credit cards like, yeah, are subsidized in a way, the scams, because you get your money back. But, um, so I have to be a bit more careful, but at the end, it's so much more convenient and so much better. Um, that like I, I couldn't go back to the traditional system. And now, if you're if for for a lot of people, I know um, a lot of people in APEC where you have a you know a lot of inter-country commerce, but not the same infrastructure of money transfers that you have within the EU or within the US. You know this is taking off like crazy, right? So what I want to say is that it actually. Um, so while it's true that they're scamming, right, you can find a ton of positive use cases where it actually makes people's life easier because it's decentralized, right? That's the whole point because there's no central point that extracts money. Um, you just need to do the, the due diligence to have the right um, infrastructure. And, of course, you still need someone to convert it if you, if you need to convert money into the traditional currencies. But there are uh, ways to do that. Um, another part is um, you know, that, that a lot of um, funding can be done this way. So, again, it's, it's often a better way to do microfunding uh, than, for example, GoFundMe and things like that, which, again, intervene, right? I mean, GoFundMe has, a political, uh, has proven to do political interventions, for example, where they will allow certain kinds of campaigns but not other and not applying their own rules consistently. So that's, um, that, that's uh, a problem this solves. Um, and then people bring up FTX or like Sam Bankman Fried. Well, that was just traditional finance fraud, right? That, that had nothing to do with crypto. It was an uh, exchange that stole their customers' money and did their own trading with it. Right? That has nothing to do with crypto at all. Um, it's more like, uh, uh, I mean, I guess, was Manafort? No, what, what, no, what was the name? Ah, the guy who uh, stole the money. Yeah, anyhow, um, he's in jail. Sam Bankman Fried is in jail. So the petty, the petty words. Um, so this is kind of it's traditional open source. You run your own instance of something, right? Or or someone does. It's like micro centralization. So it's federated services that are open source services. People run for you. Um, and then they sync, which is great. You can run your own. Uh, you have to then negotiate to get into, the, uh, into the, the federation, which is pretty easy. But you don't have to run your own. You can actually join an existing server. 
Um, some of them have, like Noster has more a relay structure. So you would run kind of your own relay or join a relay. You can pay people to run this for you. So it's, it's not always like relying just on volunteers. Um, so, you know, the big ones I use is Mastodon and, and Noster. Um, they, they are really useful to get out of the centralization, but they do not have an implicit payment uh, model, right? So payments are outside, out of band for them, and um, they're trust-based. So I, if I, I join one of these servers, at the end I trust the person to, up, to hold, uphold their end of the bargain. If I pay them, I have a contract. If it's voluntary, then you know, there's not much I can do. Um, so uh, it's not like I'm not sovereign in that. I, I'm using something that someone else is offering. It's more like, you know, it's more like traditional open source, but um, but not uh, doesn't give you the same abilities without a major investment, right? Which means run your own service again. So Web three. What's Web three? Web three on the other side is it's using the same. Underlying technologies that cryptocurrencies use, so blockchain technologies, right, to different degrees, right? It doesn't mean that everything is always on the blockchain because it doesn't always work. But even in cryptocurrencies, most things are not on the blockchain, right? If you're, if, if you're trading on an exchange, like if you use Coinbase, um, then you are in Coinbase's system and just the inter-exchange things or things that you send to your own wallet happen on the blockchain. What happens inside the exchange is a black box that just sits on top of it. In most cases, there are some newer exchanges that are more on chain, but then on different chains. Um, but Web3 is trying to use similar technologies. So what that is is basically a distributed ledger, right? It's a consensus system that's based on distribution, where different witnesses basically find a quorum to agree that something really happened. That's at the end all it is, right? And Web3 is basically the idea to use that to create services that work basically permissionless and trustless, right? Uh, so there, you have to trust the system. I don't have to trust an individual provider of a service because there's always a quorum. It's always decentralized. There's never one central party that can control anything and define truth, define this happened or this doesn't happen. Um, um, and, you know, permissionless means, like, I don't have to negotiate with anyone. I have to just join it. And usually, joining means you put in uh, the same amount of computation work or collateral, right? Defend, depending. So some of these models, um, I'll talk about that a little bit. If I, I probably won't have time to go into details, but like just an example, if you do Filecoin, so IPFS is a Web3 file system. That's great. Um, you all use it because some of the major content delivery systems use this. Um, Cloudflare, I think, uses it. So you all use Web3 technology, even if you don't know it. Filecoin is a payment system on top of that. You can go in there and say, I want to provide storage service in the, in the Filecoin universe, and then people can bid for that and use your storage. There's some validation. But in order to do that, you actually have to put in money as a security right? that you will lose if you violate the contract. Right? So, they, 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 so these systems have things like that built in. Where payment is implicitly built in and collateral is implicitly built in to make sure you actually hold up your contract, right? Just saying, okay, I have some storage, and then, oh, sorry, I delete your data, actually you lose money, right? And they pay you for, for the storage you provide. Um, so uh, it's all open source, right? Implicitly, that is all open source. Um, that is wild. Yeah, yeah, but so I'm also, I'm, I'm getting there. So uh, recap. Um, so I, I think, I, be, I truly believe that the future of free software depends on decentralization, right? It doesn't have to be all decentralized. You don't have to stop using uh, GitHub, but I think doing some other things. I, I have been using GitLab quite a bit just so that there is someone else. I think that, uh, for example, the CentOS decision to go with GitLab was exactly the right thing to do. We need multiple choice. If there is no competition, then bad things happen, right? When there are no alternatives, bad things happen. I think we need to go further and even, especially with something like Git and, and collaboration, go further and do more decentralization. Same with anything that has opinions and um, anything that depends on people storing stuff, right? These are straightforward things 
where um, a model where you can just put in some hardware and maybe some collateral and then be then offers a service, right? If we can make that grow into a healthy ecosystem, that's much superior to any model where there's one party offering or, or three big companies all in the US offering uh, the, the service. Um, I think it's really important to look at the technologies and the use cases and ignore any labels or, you know, I, I mean, it's, Web3 is coded one way. Some of that is purely arbitrary, right, based on kind of who are the people doing it. I think um, it's important to look past that and evaluate technologies for their use for you. Um, I understand that a lot of people say, well, Web3, distributed ledger, that's a lot that's very complicated way, very expensive way of doing a database. I agree, but it's a decentralized way of doing it, and um, there are use cases where that's the only way to get to a proper decentralized ecosystem. Um, and just, and that's my last slide, bunch of starting points. I really recommend trying out. I mean, never, Mastodon, everyone knows, Noster is really nice as an alternative to Twitter, although not enough content. Uh, Lemmy is really interesting as a link aggregation for Fediverse and Web3. So it's not Web3, right? The first three are not Web3, but I don't think that that's a hard uh, uh, boundary anyways, right? Lemmy kind of sits on the boundary, I'd say. Uh, Radical is a Web3 GitHub alternative that's emergent. That's really interesting. I really recommend taking a look at that. Um, Fileverse, if, you, if you're using Google Docs, try out Fileverse. Doesn't have presentations yet, so otherwise I would be presenting from it. Um, but it's really nice, really straightforward, and has some interesting new features they are uh, they have in beta right now to get your like personal portals to do your collaboration in. It's really interesting um, and easy to use. IPS Filecoin is more like for professional storage as an alternative to S3. Um, status is really interesting, and uh, some of you, you know, if, so there there are some ex Redditors working there. Um, at status that's, um, or VACU, but which is the underlying uh, uh, technology and, and, and initiative. But status kind of, a, it's a really nice um, Discord alternative um, that's really straightforward to use. Um, and then uh, Gitcoin is kind of a microfunding approach for projects, which is also really interesting. So I recommend just trying these out. Some of them are a bit more mature than others. Um, and, but you know, the only way we can explore whether this really works and build an alternative to centralized cloud is if we try these things out and do the extra step to actually use them. And I forgot actually one, a cache net, which is, uh, I don't know why I forgot that. I'll put them before I post them. I really recommend a cache net, which is a Web3 Kubernetes platform where you can host workloads. Um, it, it's really interesting. And that's where like, you would put up your, your radical so it's the uh, turtles all the way down. Thank you very much. I'll be around if anyone wants to.